welcome to a wonderful event this evening. First, let me uh, invite the students who are here. This is primarily done to get the students excited to discuss, understand very compelling conversation that is going on across the nation, very controversial issues going on in the, uh, in the world today. So this is to welcome the students first. I also want to welcome all the guests here. In particular, I want to welcome Professor Stephen Coons and Daniel Schrag from the University of uh, from the Harvard University to the University of Maryland campus. Welcome here. I also want to give a shout out to the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets and the board members sitting here uh, and the leadership of uh, Professor Rajeshri Agarwal. They are actually part of this bigger conversation that the Smith School of Business is trying to have in the strategic plan. We have two guiding principles for us, which are very important. One, that business is for everyone. Business matters for all. Why is it important today, whether you're in social work or in engineering? Having a good understanding of the business fundamentals makes you better, makes you more productive. The second one is intellectual curiosity. We want every one of our students to be critical thinkers, not to be preached of what we believe sitting on the podium, but for you to be looking at the evidence and make your own interpretation asking the tough questions and the right questions, not based on political belief, not based on somebody else's belief, but you make the choice, be critical thinkers. In that spirit, Ed Snyder Center actually provides that valuable platform for us to launch a conversation, a series about understanding difficult issues, a difficult conversations. It's evidence-based. You make the interpretation based on what it is about. Along with that, based on what's going on in the world, we want civilized conversation, a conversation we are willing to listen to the other side, not to shut them down, but to hear the other side, why they make certain arguments, and you be the judge whether it makes the right sense. Today is about climate science and the implications and the actions that are taken. Different groups have different viewpoints. So you be the judge based on today's discussions. In order to introduce today's event, let me call on Professor Rajeshri Agarwal. Those of you who don't know, she is one of the most highly cited faculty in the world in management and organization. She's a power, and always don't mess with Professor Agarwal. I was in Texas for 27 years. I have to use the word, don't mess with blah, blah, blah. So here is Professor Agarwal. I welcome her to introduce uh, this event. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Kanana. And good evening to everyone here. Uh, a particularly big shout out to the students of the future of you, business, and society. Um, can you? My phone light's on. Isn't that weird? It no longer is butt call anymore. It's always lights that come on there. So appreciate you letting me know that. Uh, so welcome. I'm Rashri Agarwal. I'm the director of the Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets. And um, as Dean Kanana said, we have our excellent board members here too that are attending this event because we had our board of advisors meeting this morning as well. What the Snyder Center stands for is again enterprise and markets because we do believe that human enterprise is the engine of human flourishing and economic prosperity. And markets, of course, help each and every one of us trade with each other. Organizations and markets are first and foremost platforms for collaboration. But you cannot have collaboration if you are not looking at what the other person's perspectives are. So you need to know what your own abilities are, your own aspirations are, and what you would like to do in order to make the world a better place by doing something important to you. But at the same time, you need to have that same understanding of your trade partners. Because before we can engage in collaboration, we have to make sure that we're aligned. 
Now, being aligned does not mean talking to each other in the same echo chamber. Being aligned actually requires us to be uncomfortable, be willing to not have a closed mind, but not have an open mind either where anything goes. Instead, it is about having an active mind so that you're not preaching, you're not prosecuting, and you're not politicking either, but you're thinking like a scientist. This is, in fact, from Think Again by Adam Grant. The University of Maryland deeply, deeply cares about these principles. You've already heard Dean Kanana talk about how intellectual curiosity and the willingness to agree or disagree is a core part of the strategic plan. But it goes all the way from the precedence of this university. So way back in 2018, when our partners, the Steamboat Institute, first came, to campus in their inaugural Campus Liberty Tour, Wallace Law was the president and there was picketing outside because we had both Vicente Fox and Nigel Farage. And there was a huge objection to uh, Nigel Farage in particular to be there. And at that point, Wallace Law made a very compelling statement. He said, the role of a university is not to make ideas safe for students but to make students feel safe to challenge diverging views. Last year, at the same Steamboat event, uh, President Pines was also available, and he noted, our responsibility is to raise questions, listen to one another's point of view respectfully and with an open mind, and move towards building a better understanding of the particular problem that we are talking about. At the Ed Snyder Center and the University of Maryland, Smith, we take this very seriously. In fact, for all of you undergraduate students, there is a new course that we are developing that takes the challenge, the conversation, one step further. So next semester, we will be launching a brand new three credit course, which has been approved and funded by the university in their big innovation challenge grant. Professor Pratiti Dastadar, stand up Pratiti, shout out for you, right? She will be, she will be the instructor for the course, and the course is going to be about challenge your thinking and challenge your conversation. So, if you enroll in this course, you won't just be passive listeners to a debate event such as this. You will actually engage with exactly this issue. Develop your own point of view by doing research. Debate each other. Then come to an event like this where we have expert panelists talk about the issue and then reflect back. I hope you can see why this is very critical for the future of you as business leaders, as civic leaders, and as engaged individuals that want to make the world a better place. Our own initiative in doing this is to ensure that events such as those hosted by the Steamboat Institute Campus Liberty Tour comes to you. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you the Snyder Center board member, Jennifer Schubert Aiken, who is the CEO and president of the Steamboat Institute. She has been a fearless leader of it since 2008, and in the last 2018 to 2022, that's four years, right? I don't do math well, I said. Uh, she has been uh, introducing these events to us, so I am going to cede the floor to her so that she can introduce our distinguished panelists and we can get the role started. Thank you.
Okay, good evening, everyone. It is so great to be back on the Maryland campus. Thank you, Rajshree and Dean Konana, for welcoming us back to your campus. We always get such a warm welcome here. Um, we always appreciate having the opportunity to collaborate with the Ed Snyder Center. And I just want to tell you, after hearing from Dean Konana, and you just heard uh, from Rajshree also, but earlier today, Dean Konana spoke to our um, Snyder Center Advisory Board. I hope you realize what you have here at the University of Maryland with strong leadership that doesn't just talk, but actually walks the walk about promoting free speech and ideological diversity on your campus. So I think you need to give a round of applause to your dean of your business school for being so strong. I'm just going to be very brief, tell you about the Steamboat Institute. I know most of you probably don't know who we are. Uh, as Raj Shree said, we, we started things with a bang with the Campus Liberty Tour in 2018 when we brought Nigel Farage and Vicente Fox to your campus. It was a lot of fun. Um, that one was actually televised live on C-SPAN that night. So you can still find it there. And uh, it's received hundreds of thousands of views. The resolution being debated tonight is one of the most hotly contested topics of our time. Climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Now you've seen these cards that were on your seat, hopefully. You can vote um, in a poll. I think you should have received a text um, also to vote in the poll. We're doing a poll before our speakers take the stage and begin the debate. So vote, whether it's yes, no, or undecided on that resolution. Then at the end, uh, we will uh, have you submit your opinions again, and we'll see if opinions have changed after the debate is over. Uh, also, during the debate, um, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions using, once again, the QR code. So be sure to submit your questions. Our moderator will be selecting your questions to ask. She'll be viewing them on a tablet. So we want all of you to participate and uh, get your questions answered. Briefly, uh, before we begin tonight, just want to let you know, and, and we've, we've had this up here on the screen, this is the first of three debates we are doing on this resolution this week, so we have a, a busy travel week. Uh, tomorrow night we will be at the University of Dallas in Irving, Texas, where Dr. Coonan will be debating Gernot Wagner from Columbia Business School, and then on Thursday evening we'll be in Oklahoma City at Oklahoma State University's new Ham Institute for American Energy, um, where Andrew Dessler a uh, climate uh, professor at uh, Texas A&M University will debate Dr. Coonan in Oklahoma City on the same resolution. If you have friends in Dallas or Oklahoma City, tell them to go to steamboatinstitute.org and register, grab a free ticket, and come join us. You can watch these and um, any of our previous debates in, in their entirety on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. This debate tonight and the next two should be up on our YouTube channel by early next week. So I encourage you to check that out. And now we'd like to show you, this is just a, an 84 second trailer that shows you some of the highlights of some of our past debates, which I hope you will enjoy. Welcome to the Steamboat Institute Campus Liberty Tour. The fact is we're having a proper, full, honest, open debate, and boy, there are going to be differences. It uses state boundaries like the watertight compartments on an ocean You'd line. never have a nationwide recount, but you would under NPV. The truth is, is in a national popular vote system, I am not afraid of my ideas. In which we secure a bedrock of social rights, and we can tie this to worker ownership in the sphere of production. What is the capitalist answer? Well, I'm for competition, I'm for small businesses, I'm for a lot of things you're saying that you're for. I just think the way to do it is to let people be free. So I'm going to continue to defend free speech as long as I have the strength to do it, and I'm going to do it for people who I despise, for people who I disagree with, for people who are I am offended by. The Brexit vote. Free speech. The migration. National popular vote. We are not fake news. Accepting democracy, respectful of other people, regardless of whether you disagree, and one in which it is expected there's civility and trust, rather than incivility and distrust that permeates the country today. Okay, great. Um, and for next year, we are planning another series of debates. Um, so please follow Steamboat Institute um, on all social, social media platforms, and you'll know about those when they're coming up in 2023. 
just one more thing briefly before I introduce our speakers. I want you to know that Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour debates are gaining in popularity and importance because of cancel culture. We all know about cancel culture. While that seems to be taking over, Steamboat Institute takes the opposite approach, encouraging free and robust debate on even the most contentious issues. Our emphasis is on teaching all of you how to think, not what to think. We, we cannot um, maintain our democratic republic if we don't have people like all of you and leaders who can engage in civilized debate and critical thinking. Um, in planning this series of debates on climate change and ener energy policy, we found it very difficult to find climate experts who were willing to debate Dr. Koonin. Um, some of the responses we received from well-known climate scientists and academics stated that we were wildly irresponsible for giving him a platform, that there is no room for debate on these issues, and my favorite from a well-known climatologist who is on Reuters' hot list of the world's top climate scientists was, I don't debate climate science, it's a poor way of getting at the truth. Well, these two gentlemen are going to show you that that is, is not the case. We applaud both Dr. Koonin and Dr. Schrag for participating in this debate tonight. Steamboat Institute will con continue to give both sides of any issue a fair and balanced platform to make their case, and we hope all of you will see that that's the way things should be. Uh, finally, we are a nonprofit organization. The Steamboat Institute depends on the generous support of many individuals and foundations to carry out our work. Uh, some of our major sponsors I would like to thank for allowing us to put on this debate tour. The Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the Snyder Foundation, and the Robert and Judy Newman Family Foundation. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker and speakers and moderators. So I'd like to ask them to go ahead and come up on the stage. And then I will um, read their bios to you so you know a little bit about them. Welcome, panelists. <laughs> Arguing the affirmative on tonight's resolution is Daniel Schrag. Dr. Schrag is the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology at Harvard, Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering, and Director of the Harvard University Center for the Environment. His primary appointment is in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, with additional appointments in the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the Harvard Kennedy School, where he also co-directs the program on science, technology, and public policy at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Dr. Schrag studies climate and climate change over the broadest range of Earth history. He is particularly interested in how information on climate change from the geologic past can lead to a better understanding of anthropogenic climate change in the future. In addition to his work on geochemistry and climatology, Dr. Schrag studies energy technology and policy, including carbon capture and storage and low carbon synthetic fuels. From, 20, uh, uh, from 2009 to 2017, Dr. Schrag served on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and, and Technology. And among many honors, he is the recipient of the James B. McElwain Medal from the American Geophysical Union and a MacArthur Fellowship. Dr. Schrag earned a BS in Geology and Geophysics and Political Science from Yale University and his PhD in Geology from the University of California at Berkeley. He came to Harvard in 1997 after teaching at Princeton. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Daniel Schrag. <laughs> Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution is Stephen Koonin. Dr. Koonin is a leader in science policy, having served as Undersecretary for Science in the U.S. Department of Energy under President Obama. In this role, he was the lead author of the department's strategic plan and of the inaugural Quadrennial Technology Review, which started in 2011. With more than 200 peer-reviewed papers in the fields of physics and astrophysics, scientific computation, energy technology, and climate science, Dr. Koonin was a professor of theoretical physics at Caltech, also serving as Caltech's vice president and provost for nearly a decade. Dr. Koonin is currently a professor at New York University with appointments in the Stern School of Business, the Tandon School of Engineering, and the Department of Physics. 
Dr. Coonan's memberships include the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Jason Group of scientists who solve technical problems for the U.S. government. He is the author of Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. Since the book's release in April of 2021, more than 200,000 copies have been sold. Welcome, Dr. Coonan. Our moderator for tonight's debate is Sarah Westwood. Sarah is a political and investigative reporter at the Washington Examiner where she writes on a range of pressing political issues. Prior to joining the Examiner, Sarah was a White House reporter for CNN, a Robert Novak Journalism Fellow at the Fund for American Studies, and a graduate of the National Journalism Center Fellowship Program. And this past August, Sarah was awarded the 10th Annual or 10th Tony Blankley Fellowship for Public Policy and American Exceptionalism by the Steamboat Institute. So welcome, Sarah. All right, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Like Jennifer mentioned, today we are debating whether climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you all who have voted in the poll so far. If you haven't done so already, the information's at the bottom. And also, please, uh, throughout the debate, be submitting your questions via the QR code because towards the end, I will be asking your questions. Um, so next, each debater is going to have 10 minutes to present their opening statements, then five minutes each to present a rebuttal, and we're going to begin with Dr. Shrek. Okay, I'm gonna guess I'm gonna use this microphone and turn, keep this one off, is that right? Sounds great. Okay, so here is our, our question. Climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I don't think this is the most controversial statement in our society, given that most of the countries around the world have actually agreed to this already, but we'll come back to that point. I think some of the questions that Steve and I will discuss tonight have to do with what is large and what is rapid, and also who is us, because that is a really important issue that we'll talk about. Um, the Earth is warming. It's warmed about 1.2 degrees or so Celsius, a little more than two degrees Fahrenheit over the last 120 years or 150 years or so. Um, not entirely surprising. Over 125 years ago, this man, oh, something has been messed up on my slides. Well, um, uh, this got turned around somehow. Um, this man, Svante Arrhenius, and first Swedish scientist to win a Nobel Prize. He won the chemistry prize in 1903. He wrote a paper called, I can't read it now, but it was on the influence of carbonic acid, which is carbon dioxide, on the temperature of the ground, in the air on the temperature of the ground, 1896. And he basically got the physics of the greenhouse effect right. In a popular book in about 1904, he basically calculated that if the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere doubled, then due to coal burning, which was the dominant fossil fuel at the time, that temperature on the Earth would increase by about four degrees Celsius. Today we think that's a little high, it's probably closer to three degrees, but not bad for 1896. So um, this is not a new problem, we've known about this for a long time. Of course we know a lot more. This is the Keeling curve showing the rise in CO2. Dave Keeling started measuring carbon dioxide in Mauna Loa, Hawaii. It was 315 parts per million in 1958. It was 380 parts per million when he died in 2005. And today it's over 420 parts per million. His son Ralph continues these measurements. The fact that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and is going to cause warming of the planet, that's not controversial. What is controversial is exactly how much, exactly what's going to happen, and how everyone on the planet's gonna be affected, including, uh, um, you know, I'm, I wish we'd straightened this out before, I, I, I thought you'd previewed the slides. So, um, unfortunately, things have been turned sideways, and is there any way we can straighten this out? I guess not. Um, I'll just, you'll have to look sideways. I apologize, this is, this is an unfortunate um, occurrence. This is the way, so, so when people look at the Keeling curve, you see the rise in CO2. As a geologist, I look at it a little differently. I see a rise uh, 
like this. And if you turn your head, you'll see this graph is now the same thing. It's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's over the last 800,000 years reconstructed from ice cores that trap bubbles of air from Antarctica. And what you see, and I, I, I will use this pointer here to try to show you, there are fluctuations between, you can't see the numbers, but 180 parts per million up to, this one is right about 300 or a little below 300 parts per million. Those are the regular fluctuations associated with the ice age cycles over the last several million years. In that context, this is the Keeling curve. This rise from the pre-industrial level about 280 parts per million up to today's value around 420. We're doing an experiment on the planet and indirectly we know that CO2 levels haven't been this high we think for many millions of years and by mid-century or late this century will be at levels we haven't seen probably for 35 or 40 million years. So we're doing an experiment on the entire planet and one of the points I want to give you as a geologist is that the time scales in the Earth system, the inertia in the Earth system, those time scales are really long. So we are setting in motion things that we don't have the capability of controlling. This is a picture of essentially the spatial footprint of global warming. This is done by NASA and they're five-year averages and the reason we take five-year averages is because we're getting rid of seasonal variability and year-to-year -year variability. We're kind of looking at the spatial footprint of warming. Not that much happens until the mid-80s. You'll see mid-70s suddenly then you'll see really a lot going on. Um, and there we are at the end. That's the change that we've seen. This is relative to a mid-century baseline mid 20th century baseline. So what you see here is something very distinctive, which is, I hope everybody recognizes this, the continents are warming a lot faster than the oceans. This is exactly what you expect from the physics of climate change. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap infrared radiation and re-radiate it back, essentially creating an energy imbalance. And the Earth's trying to heat up so that it emits as much radiation to space is coming in from the sun, but the oceans are keeping it from doing that. The oceans are sucking up heat. Indeed, 90% of the energy imbalance from climate change is going into heating the oceans. So the oceans are like our big heat sink. That's good. We haven't experienced all the warming yet. The oceans are keeping us cool. It's bad in that it's going to take many, many centuries, perhaps even a millennium, for the ocean to warm up to reach a new equilibrium. So we have already committed the Earth to warming for centuries in the future, unless we control our CO2 emissions. And again, this just shows temperature over land has increased since the 70s about twice as much as the temperature over the ocean. Now, I want to give you some other timescales involved. In Antarctica, which is a huge ice sheet capable of raising sea level about 60 meters if it all disappeared, there's a, a part a glacier system called the Thwaites Glacier. Some of you may never have heard of this. It's connected to a, a, an ice shelf, which is a part of land ice that's now floating in the ocean. I'm going to show you a cross section of this. Here is the ice shelf. This is the floating ice. And this is the glacier behind it. What's happening is this ice shelf is retreating, not because of surface warming, but because the ocean is warming beneath it, down at six or 800 meters depth. The ocean has now absorbed enough heat that this ice shelf is collapsing from underneath. And scientists are arguing about whether it's already past the point of no return or whether it's very close to the point of no return. But they expect that by sometime in the next decade, that ice shelf will break off and essentially the only thing left will be this huge glacial system that will flow downhill into the ocean by gravity. That is, we will have unleashed about one and a half to two meters of sea level rise that is unstoppable on a time scale of, glaciologists argue about this, something between 50 and 200 years. Two meters of sea level in 50 years could be absolutely catastrophic. Think of all of South Florida disappearing. That's the scale of the impact we're talking about. And there are many other long time scales in the system, the carbon cycle. So something like uh, Half of our CO2 that we put in the air stays in the air. Other half gets taken up by the ocean and the land. That's good. It's giving us a buffer. But half of what's left in the air will still be there a 1,000 years from now. And something like a third of it will still be there more than 10,000 years from now. 
We are setting in motion things that will last for tens of thousands of years. And that's very difficult for humans to think about on those timescales. Um, there are other mysteries, surprises. This is a picture of an escarpment in Siberia where the permafrost is thawing and releasing organic carbon that gets oxidized to carbon dioxide. There's enough carbon in the permafrost in Siberia to, equivalent to all the fossil fuels we burned in the last 150 years. If all that permafrost thaws, we will lose control of the system. And the uncertainty about exactly how fast it'll thaw is enormous. But that means that there's a huge risk, and we have to think about mitigating that risk. Carbon dioxide emissions, this shows that you know, where the world is, US is decreasing, um, and uh, other countries continue to increase in the developing world. There's a lot of good news. US, for the last few years, 75% of our new electricity capacity has been wind and solar. That's because it's gotten really cheap. That's exciting. But I want to also show you that there's extraordinary risk here. We've seen amazing disasters. We don't have time to go through all of them. But this is Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston and dropped 60 inches of rain in just a couple of days. Even scarier is Zhengzhou in China. Eight inches of rain in one hour. And it was the most extraordinary flood. So in the end, climate science, this is the question. Climate science compels us to make large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. What does the dismal climate science have to say? What, is, what does economics say? And the social cost of carbon, which is a measure of what an additional ton of carbon dioxide would do to the climate, well, it varies on discount rate, but it's a number around $50 a ton. I'm going to end here, but I will just say, yes, science does compel us. We have our moral obligations to future generations and our role in a responsible world leadership, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that. Thank you. Dr. Gillen. Nope, not that one. Can we get the first slide in the deck? We got problems. Yep. There we go. Great. All right, that's the proposition. It sounds great. Follow the science. But in the real world, we have to balance the certainties and uncertainties of the science against the growing demand for reliable and affordable energy. In that light, the proposition fails, and it fails dramatically. Large and rapid reductions are unjustified, immoral, and fantastical. I will begin with the word compels, which makes the proposition unjustified. The UN estimates that we'll see as much warming in the next 100 years as we've already seen since 1900. That's about 1.3 degrees Celsius. During or perhaps despite that prior warming, we've seen the greatest improvement ever in the human condition. Lifespan, literacy, nutrition, and economic activity have all increased dramatically, even as the population quintupled since 1900. The rate of extreme poverty dropped from 70% down to 10%. And relevant to this discussion, the death rate from extreme weather today is 1 50th of what it was in 1900. So it beggars belief to think that another 1.3 degrees of warming in the next century is going to significantly derail that progress. Even though the climate varies are on on its own, many people allege that we've broken the climate in the last few decades. And you saw some of the dramatic weather events that Dan showed you. But the IPCC, the UN's climate panel, says it's hard to find long-term global trends in most types of weather extremes, including storms, droughts, and floods. And so economic loss rates have actually declined slightly over the last 30 years, averaging about two-tenths of a percent 
of the global GDP. I don't think we can even measure it that accurately. A wealthier world is a more resilient world. Well, maybe the future will be a lot worse. But the UN projects substantial economic growth even in an emissions-heavy scenario. In 2014, they said for most economic sectors, the impact of climate change will be small relative to the impacts of other drivers. There's what they said. Research since then confirms that warming is expected to be a minor hindrance to growth. A few degrees by the end of the century would make the growing economy a few percent smaller than it might have been otherwise. Of course, there are uncertainties in these projections. GDP is not the only measure of well-being, and the rich will fare better than the poor. But the term existential crisis is hardly justified. One might still fret about severe but unlikely climate impacts. And so we hear something very bad might happen. We don't know what or when or just how bad, but we'd better act. The well-to-do might clutch their pearls over that. But it's hardly compelling for most of the world, which has many more impactful, immediate, and soluble problems. And so the world, us, makes the proposition immoral. There are one and a half billion of us in the developed world, and we enjoy abundant and affordable energy. But the globe's other six and a half billion people are energy poor. And the inequalities are astounding. We Americans consume 30 times more energy per capita than Nigerians. And three billion of the world's eight billion people, 40%, use less electricity every year than the average US refrigerator. Energy poverty means cooking with wood and dung. Smoke in the kitchen kills some two million people every year. And while dining by candlelight might be romantic, studying by candlelight is not. Global energy demand will increase 50% by the middle of this century as most of the world develops. Fossil fuels are the most reliable and convenient way for developing countries to get that energy, as they have long been for everybody. And so global emissions will grow in the coming decades, even as the developed world's emissions decline slowly. And remember, just to stabilize human influences on the climate, not reduce them, the warming influences at an allegedly safe level, require that emissions will vanish in the latter half of this century. And this graph, which is a projection, of course, only goes up to 2050. So this curve has got to go to zero, say some people. Reliable and affordable energy is the overwhelming priority for developing nations. And so when the proposition says science compels us, the response of the developing world is, what do you mean, us? The Indian Prime Minister protests that the path for development is being closed to developing nations, while the Nigerian president says Africa is being punished by Western decisions and will fight to exploit the fossil fuels it has. In my opinion, they're right. It is immoral for the developed world to deny the developing world the energy that they need. And it is the height of carbon colonialism to restrain that development by mandating costly and ineffective energy systems if we're not going to pay the extra cost. The proposition is also immoral because exaggerations like science compels induce echo anxiety. Some 60% globally of young people are very worried about climate change, and many are therefore reluctant to have children. Net zero emissions by even 2100 would be an heroic achievement. But the world isn't facing climate catastrophe, and so it's pernicious to exaggerate the importance and urgency of reducing emissions at the expense of more immediate and impactful societal needs. Finally, the fantasy of large and rapid reductions. Energy systems change slowly for fundamental reasons. Their infrastructure lasts for decades. They have to work together, all the different parts, as a system. And there are many stakeholders whose interests don't often align. It also takes time, 
to refine the hardware and the operating procedures to ensure high reliability. And so large and rapid is very problematic. A zero emissions electrical grid is central to decarbonization strategies. Solar panels and wind turbines are the current fashion. And they are today the cheapest way of generating electricity. But you need a backup system for when there's no sun or wind. Technologies like natural gas with carbon capture or nuclear or some form of storage like giant batteries. That reliability is the costliest aspect of building a renewables heavy grid. Ensuring high reliability that we enjoy today in the US, 99.99% would more than double the cost of electricity if you want to get most of it from wind and solar. But reliability is only one of many oops issues as we careen toward a renewables heavy all electric world. Solar and wind need an order of magnitude more land. They also need a lot more stuff. Wind takes 10 times as much concrete and steel than nuclear. And renewables use 10 times more high value materials like copper, molybdenum, and dysprosium. Unfortunately, those high value materials and their processing are today concentrated in inconvenient countries. The Democratic Republic of the Congo produces 75% of the world's cobalt, and China is a major player in extracting rare earths and other critical materials. All that means is that there's going to be a tremendous increase in mining and manufacturing as new energy technologies are deployed and an increase in their environmental impacts. Renewables will not remain the cheapest form of generation. Mineral supplies will have a hard time keeping up. Lithium prices have already surged, and copper demand is going to be really difficult in the next 10 years. So to sum up, the proposition is unjustified. There is no imminent climate catastrophe, and so we don't need to make large and rapid reductions. The proposition is also immoral. We can't condemn most of humanity to expensive, inadequate energy, so we shouldn't do it. And then finally, the proposition is fantastical. Techno-economic realities mean that large and rapid changes to energy systems will be expensive, disruptive, and counterproductive, so we can't do it. These three points are why you should not support the proposition. Thank you. Dr. Shrag, you now have five minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you so much. So let me first say I agree with Steve on a couple of things. It is absolutely unconscionable for us to ask the poorest countries of the world to reduce their emissions at this point in time. That is, to sacrifice their own economic development for that purposes. To put this in perspective, all of Sub-Saharan Africa, except for South Africa, all of Sub-Saharan Africa put together has cumulatively contributed 1% of global cumulative emissions. 1%. The US has contributed 25%. So asking any country in Sub-Saharan Africa to sacrifice their economic well-being to reduce their emissions seems to me totally absurd. But you know, Steve, I'm disappointed because you, you place, when you talk about the immorality of us, you, you have such a limited choice of views of the world. We're choosing between renewable energy versus what you say are the cheapest and, and uh, most reliable sources of energy, essentially fossil fuel development. But to me, that's a false dichotomy. There's another path that we have to think about. And that is a significant investment in our world in a clean pathway of development. And ultimately, since these countries are in early stages of development, they will adopt those clean technologies. Already, low penetration wind and solar, as Steve said, is cheaper than anything else. Just to put that in perspective, Ireland and Spain, two countries that have isolated grids because of their geography, have 40% wind or wind and solar. The US is at 14%. When we catch up to Ireland and Spain, then we can talk about the difficult part of decarbonizing, which is going to happen. We're going to hit that, but it's going to be decades in the future. And in that time, new technology will develop. 
Electric vehicles is another nice example. Automobile companies have already made the factory investments. They're switching over. This is already happening. And within five, maybe 10 years, EVs will be much cheaper than internal combustion engine vehicles when you consider the entire cost of ownership. Then you don't have to convince countries in Africa or South Asia to buy them. They'll buy them because they're cheaper and better. That's the vision for the future. And let me just return to the thing I got sh cut short on because of the mess up with the slides. You know, the social cost of carbon is the economist's best estimate, all of this considered, of what our emissions cost today. And 50 bucks a ton, maybe 70 is the right number. The IRA, the big climate bill in the US, $40 billion a year roughly over the next 10 years. And $40 billion a year, the US emits a little more than 5 billion tons of CO2 a year. That's $8 a ton. So does that mean we're going too rapidly? No. When, when we start spending 30 or $40 a ton, then we should have a discussion of whether we're going too fast. But while we're still spending such a paltry amount on this technological transition that other countries have already bought into, well, I don't think we're going too fast. I actually think we're going wildly too slowly, and I think the evidence is very clear. Thanks very much. A couple of remarks on um, things Dan mentioned. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention the N-word at all, uh, nuclear. Uh, many people believe that small nuclear reactors will be an essential part of a future emissions-free grid, and that's one of the things we should be developing. Uh, when I was in the Department of Energy, I helped to get that underway. As you know, Bill Gates has put a lot of money into uh, small reactors. There are other startups. So I think that's an essential part. Many people don't like nuclear for whatever reason, but it, again, if you want to do this, that's something you're going to have to do. Um, on the IRA, um, yes, wind and solar are the cheapest. And so I would ask the politicians, why did you provide so much subsidy for wind and solar? The subsidies in the IRA essentially reduce the cost of wind and solar generation to zero. And that means you reap enormous tax credits. You can go sell those tax credits. It's about 50 billion a year, I think. Um, it's basically a giveaway for people who would be deploying this anyway if wind and solar were, in fact, the cheapest. So that's not a very good thing. Um, another point on the social cost of carbon which Dan has mentioned a couple times, there are at least two ingredients in calculating that. One is the discount rate. What do you believe will be the future value of money compared to today? If you take a very high discount rate, as you would pay in a business, the social cost of carbon turns out to be pretty low. If you take a low discount rate, the social cost of carbon goes up. The other important ingredient, and what you choose for that is really philosophical. When Nick Butler, no, um, Nick, Stern. Nick Stern, sorry, I'm missing up my British Nicks. Uh, when Nick Stern did his famous Stern report in 2005 or so, he essentially assumed zero discount rate. And so uh, the cost of carbon uh, is significant. The other important ingredient is the damage function. How much will rising temperatures degrade the economy? And for me, that's the fundamental thing. Uh, and the answer, as I showed you, it's a couple percent. If the world warmed four degrees, which is twice as much as what Paris has been talking about, we would see less than 10% on average economic damage, while the economy would have grown by a factor of four. Okay? So I don't put a lot of stock in the cost of carbon numbers. Um, as much as Dan does. Um, that's probably uh, enough for right now. Okay. I don't disagree with anything he said about the science. Okay. I think we probably agree on that. The question is, how do you manage this risk? Great. Thank you both for those opening statements and your rebuttals.
Please continue sending your questions uh, to me via the QR code. And my first question is going to be for you, Dr. Schrag, with Dr. Koonin, if you would like please, to respond Please call to me it. Dan. We're calling each other yeah, Dan yeah, and yeah. Steve. We've known, <laughs> known each other for a long time. All right, I'll try okay. to remember that. Um, so my first question is, you know, I want to leave aside for now the question about how uh, the, the climate change concerns should be put upon other developing countries. I want to come back to that later. But in the US, the conversation about climate change tends to center on the economic impacts and specifically the fact that a rapid transition away from fossil fuels would impart consequences disproportionately on the working class. We've had Transportation Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg talk about pain at the pump potentially accelerating a transition. Is economic hardship sort of an unspoken part of the push to move away from fossil fuels? And is the climate change science so dire that any economic and societal price is worth paying uh, because the future is that bleak? Any economic price is a very big price, in my mind. And the answer is no. Of course, uh, considerations about equity to workers and, and opportunities is really important. I've got to say, though, this energy transition, and I, I, again, I agree with Steve on this point, energy systems don't change overnight. They involve huge amounts of infrastructure and manufacturing and lots of different stuff. And so, frankly, the, the worry about going too fast and leaving all the workers behind, that's not our big concern right now. Um, you know, Ford announced new factories in Tennessee and Kentucky for building the F-150 Lightnings, the electric f pickup trucks. Um, those states embraced those new job opportunities. And so, frankly, I think Detroit was a little bit disappointed that they didn't get those jobs. Um, I, I, I think that there is a, a careful path forward that involves an economic transition, and frankly, I don't think it's not discussed. I think it's discussed all the time. The reason Secretary Buttigieg was talking about it is because that's, that's what he's thinking about in transportation, managing this transition. The time scale to shift all of the cars in the US to EVs is probably closer to 30 years than to 10. Even if, the, even if in the next five or 10 years, the price switches, the, the, the cost difference switches, and EVs become cheaper, it's still going to be I would say 15 or 20 years before even close to 100%, maybe even only 80 or 90% of new cars are EVs. That takes a while. I think, I think um, various industries will transition. What will happen to the fossil fuel industry? There will be some loss of jobs. We've seen that in the coal industry already. And I think we have an obligation to support the transition of those workers in places like West Virginia or Kentucky where there's a lot of coal miners who are out of business. But this is not unique to American history. There have been economic transitions of all sorts, including Amazon and other online companies getting rid of retail stores. This is a familiar story in US history, and we can handle this. Dr. Kernan. So energy touches everything. It is a vital system for society. If you're going to change it, you need to do it in a deliberate and thoughtful way. Uh, Bill Nordhaus, a Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale, taught us a couple decades ago that you have to balance disruption from rapid changes against a growing risk of some climate thing happening. So there is an optimal path. Exactly what that is, one can debate. It depends on the damage function, technical evolution, and so on. But there is a graceful, or at least an optimal, path for this. No one has laid out a graceful decarbonization plan for the US, let alone the world. It involves technology development. It involves business, because somebody's got to make money. It involves regulation. And it involves behavior and perception. You can find academic studies done by the National Academy of Sciences, Princeton University, decarbonization pathways. But since I'm a professor and have been for many decades, I can say they're done by a bunch of academics. They have very little feeling for what the real business world is like or what the real regulatory world is like. That's what the country needs to do uh, instead of just blindly deploying wind and solar. 
Dr. Coonan, this one first to you. Um, Dr. Daniel, you can respond to that uh, after he's done. You know, advocates of increasing domestic fossil fuel energy production often point to the fact that the U.S. can produce energy more cleanly than just about anyone anywhere else in the world, that U.S. corporations are better stewards of the environment than other corporations. But that is, is it not, largely the result of the types of government intervention that you're potentially advocating against? I mean, is there perhaps a bigger role for the government to play in regulating how these fossil fuel industries conduct business? I, I think the government uh, has done a reasonable job of regulating the big energy producers. It's the little guys uh, who somehow fly under the radar. When I was in the department and then was for a while on the Energy Advisory Board, there was a big discussion about methane leaks. And um, the government decided to crack down, and appropriately so. It's money out the, up into the air, if you like, for the companies, and it is some contribution to greenhouse warming. Um, you know, environmental protection, uh, local environment, water purity, um, pollution, local pollution, absolutely, those are things we care about. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as you probably all know, there's a, currently a big discussion about regulating greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I like to cite a quip from one of my former colleagues at Caltech. If you put a price on carbon, um, you can never get it too high because somebody's going to scream. And the way our political system works, uh, there will be all kinds of screaming. The reason that coal has disappeared, Dan mentioned, is because gas was so cheap. We frack a lot, we make a lot of gas, and um, can do that. Um, just one factoid I learned today, which is interesting. Uh, Europe, for a long time, has eschewed gas production. Okay. They said, we're not going to produce gas in Europe. Of course, they were dependent on Russian gas, and that's part of what's making the current problem. Europe has 50 years worth of gas that are recoverable on the continent if they chose to produce it. And so we'll see whether the Ukraine situation gets bad enough that they're going to start fracking. To put sort of <clears throat> a finer point on the question you spoke in your opening about how both of you did about how wind and solar energy is actually cheaper ultimately to produce than some of the forms of energy on which we're primarily um, dependent right now. If that's the case, should the government be picking winners and losers in the energy sector, or is that something that the free market is ultimately going to sort out for itself? You know, um, I think every economist I know would agree in a second that the best way to regulate energy and deal with decarbonization is to put a price on CO2 because you don't pick the winners. On the, on the regulatory side, it's probably easier to pick the losers, that is, Personally, I think coal has no basis for producing electricity in this country. It's so polluting. It's so bad for conventional air pollution as well as for climate. But, but l let's put that aside. In general, a price on CO2 is by far the most efficient way to do it. Unfortunately, in the real political system we live in, that's not possible. And what the IRA represents is essentially pure industrial policy. We are subsidizing particular industries. It's unfortunate. It's not the best way to do it. But is it better than not doing anything? Absolutely. Um, and I, I will say um, it's really important to understand the, the potential of, of the drawdown of wind and solar. You know, Steve mentioned uh, how coal has been replaced by gas. That really was true in the Obama administration, mm -hmm. but not in the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. In the Trump administration, there's as much solar and wind built in four years as eight years of the Obama administration. And about half the coal, that, and, and as much coal declined in four years of Trump as eight years of Obama. And you know, half of the reason, half of the replacement was wind and solar, not gas. Yeah, I, and so I, that's I, really I, important I, to understand. And, and I, think, I think we have to step back and see this transition for, for what's happening and what is next. What are the next technologies? Batteries are coming down in cost. A variety of other technologies are coming down in cost. I actually believe in human innovation and the possibility of really transforming our energy system. It's not going to happen in 10 years, but can it happen over 50? Yeah, it, it is a Herculean effort, but I actually think it's worth doing, and that's why we need to try to do it. So, so it's worth um, pointing out 
that the U.S. at the moment is 13% of greenhouse gas emissions. And if we were to go to zero tomorrow, it would be wiped out by a decade's worth of growth in the rest of the world. So we might be very proud of ourselves that we got to zero, and maybe eventually the rest of the world will take it up if it's cheap enough, but practically in terms of its effect on the climate, um, nobody should think that we're going to stop the climate from but, changing. But Steve, I think that's a, that's a really deceptive way of mm -hmm. portraying the problem, because, because it's true. If we went to zero by ourselves, yeah, the rest of the world would keep going. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the US and Europe and a variety of other countries around the world investing and ultimately developing technologies that are cheaper and better, and then the poor countries of the world embracing those yeah. technologies. If we can, so what we do influences the choices made by the rest of the world. And portraying it just as if we're in isolation, that's just not the way the world works. Of course, but it's going to take a century at least for that to happen. You know what? Yep. I would love it if I could cut that in half, but frankly, I think we should try. And to me, what we're doing now is going way too slowly. Maybe it'll take 100 years, but if we can work hard, frankly, in almost every technological opportunity for innovation, we've exceeded our expectations. So what you're saying is, oh, it's impossible, we shouldn't even try. I actually think I, I, we should try. I did not say that. I think we should try but do so in a way that minimizes disruption, preserves U.S. competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera. There's a competitiveness risk if we don't do this, because I'll tell you, China, you, China and Europe are already going down this pathway. They are leading in many ways in terms of energy, including nuclear, including small modular nuclear. Yes. By the way, yes. I agree with you that nuclear is likely to play a very important role. I've written papers about what we call the nuclear tortoise, which is the idea that, in the U.S. at least, Nuclear is not economically competitive for right. 20 or 30 years. Right. So we right. should invest, but don't plan to build a lot of reactors in the next few decades, that's all. Well, how urgent do you think we need to act on this? I think we need to proceed according to, you know, um, you, you talk about the need for a plan. Mm -hmm. General Eisenhower, when he was not yet president, had a wonderful line. He said, planning is essential, but plans are useless. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think these academics, and I've done this with my undergraduate class for the last 15 years, designing low carbon energy systems helps us understand what the constraints are. But we have to recognize that technology is changing. Prices are changing. And whatever plan we create today, 10 years from now will be obsolete. And so it's a dynamic system, and that's how we have to think about the future. <clears throat> if I could just jump in here, you're sort of framing this, if I understand you correctly, as sort of an investment opportunity in the future to, to develop these new technologies that then the rest today, of the world Today, not in adopt. the future. Right. In Europe, a lot of countries have invested significantly in sort of the transition, Germany being one of them, and they're experiencing a lot of economic pain right now. The utility costs for Germans are, are through the roof. The city of Hamburg, for example, set to ration hot water. How can you frame this as an investment opportunity that will yield returns in the traditional sense when you are seeing the struggles that some countries are having when they have invested so much in, in yeah. it's it? It's a terrible investment. ESG, and I'll make some of these points in my closing remarks, environmental, societal, and governance investment um, is in a downward spiral because the returns are not there at all and the impact has been minimal. So the financial community is pulling away. You know, I, I think Germany is a poignant example of, of somebody who, a country that tried to do too much too early. 20 years ago, Germany decided they were going to build solar panels and invest heavily in tax credits, well, what they called feed-in tariffs, for buying down the cost of solar. And German solar was leading the world until the Chinese saw the opportunity and started manufacturing solar panels. And then, frankly, the German solar manufacturers pretty much disappeared because it was really Chinese manufacturing that brought the cost of solar down so much. Um, and so Germany's investment, which they thought they would be able to sell their solar technology to the rest of the world, turned out to be a bad idea. And you know, that's a risk when you make a big commitment. By the way, they made a huge commitment. They were, they were paying 30 cents a kilowatt hour for solar. That they also made a big mistake in depending on Russian gas. 
through the pipelines. They were warned about that 15 years ago. Some of the Baltic countries heeded that warning, built LNG terminals to keep supplying gas, where Germany now is in. Germ and Germany also had this okay. passionate hatred of nuclear power, yeah, which right. you know, which, which is it was sort of a triple cocktail. Fission was discovered, right? But, but if we actually look, even at Germany, some of the choices they've more recently made, BMW, for example, is now committed to making no, after 2025, I think, no internal combustion engines within Germany. That's extraordinary. They're going to make their switching to EVs. My wife drives a BMW plug-in hybrid that's amazing. She commutes to work, and 90% of the miles on the car are electric. And it's a fabulous car. So I actually think, you know, the last laugh, I, would, I wouldn't count German industry out. German industry is really good at some of the things they do. So when I was in the Department of Energy, we were, of course, trying to spur innovation in many of these technologies. But I had to keep reminding people that where a technology is invented is different than where it gets manufactured and is different than where it gets deployed. And so the promise of economic benefit by inventing technologies is not so obvious. All right, I want to get to some of our audience questions here. Um, we have one that asked why can't the developing world through some sort of global wealth tax on the wealthier countries start to subsidize some of that clean energy production in developing nations? Well, there was a promise in uh, Glasgow of a clean development fund. It was supposed to be a hundred, no, Paris, a hundred billion a year. It's not there. Nobody's coughing up the money. And I would say that what has been delivered is entirely inadequate to the task. Um, the developed world, US and EU in particular, but Japan, are not particularly flush with cash these days. So uh, I, I would say that's part of a bigger trend that I think is a real tragedy, actually. Um, we all know that, you know, President Trump, people always talked about his America First plan. But not a lot of people talked about how the Democratic candidates for president in 2020 in the debates were just as America First. It sounded different. But when Elizabeth Warren talked about climate change, she talked about American jobs. She didn't talk about global leadership. She didn't talk about the US having a responsibility to lead the world towards a solution of a really difficult global problem. That rhetoric, think back to the Marshall Plan after World War II, where the Secretary of State came to actually Harvard University and gave a talk outlining his vision to invest in Europe and rebuild Europe after the war. That was American leadership, and it wasn't for our own economic gain. It was for the benefit of the world to restore the world order. Yes, it was Europe and not poor countries in Africa or South Asia, but still, it was an attitude that I think a lot of American presidents in the 20th century shared, which was the sense of America having a responsibility of global leadership. That's not there now. On both sides of the aisle, support for foreign aid, which has been flat since about 2011 or something like that, there's no interest in investing heavily overseas. And that's, I think that's a real missed opportunity. Um, I would agree, but I would add that global circumstances have changed. We are not in the post-World War II era where the US was by far the dominant force in both the economy and in uh, cultural matters. The rest of the world has grown up and coming to grips with that in how we think about the US and its global influence is something that uh, we've not done yet. This is a really tough question for uh, Dr. Schrag, so I apologize, tough audience member, but stating that, by stating that German investment into renewable energy options was done too rapidly, wouldn't that go against the entire thesis of the debate um, that large and rapid reductions are necessary? No, not at all. That's not cons inconsistent at all. Again, uh, 30 cents a kilowatt hour would be equivalent to, I could do the calculation, but I can't do it quite fast enough in my head. It would probably be something like $150 a ton of CO2. We're at $8 right now. So frankly, I, I, I think it's a question of degree. 
you know, what Germany did was wildly aggressive, and I think it turned out to be a mistake. They, they did a Hail Mary, and it didn't work out for them so well. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is being deliberate, accelerating our pathway, and making smart investments. And that's, I just think, in the world that we live in today, that's just a smart strategy for the future. This one is for you, Dr. Kunin. How do you respond specifically to Dr. Schrag's statement about the ice melting in Antarctica leading to a catastrophic rise in sea levels? It wasn't melting. It's was sliding into the ocean. Sliding, which is different. excuse yeah. me. Sliding. Well, you know, we don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, we've seen evidence of it happening before when human influences were a lot smaller. Um, there are some things you just can't do anything about. Wow, that surprises me, Steve. I mean, what, what are you going to do? So, so I, I think there's a fundamental difference that we didn't really highlight for the audience. You talked about four degrees. Mm -hmm. I didn't really talk about four degrees, but when, the way I understood you to talk about it, it was kind of a linear interpolation of, from one degree. No, no. I will tell you. The damages are quadratic. The damages that Bill Nordhaus uses are quadratic. Well, they're not his, but they're other people would the fact the is same when field. we cross yeah. some number like two or three degrees yeah. we're in a different world that we haven't been in before no human has ever seen we no human has ever seen this current level of warming I, I can just imagine you sitting in 1900 and saying my god we're going to warm one and a half degrees and we're in deep trouble and but, in fact the world prospered yeah you know i think it's about risk and it's yeah. about what's the appropriate level of risk for the world and mm -hmm. and I led a study in the Obama administration, I think you might have even t come to one of our sessions, mm -hmm. about agricultural research and reform at the USDA. Out to one or two degrees, most agricultural experts think that we can adjust when we grow crops and the technology, the genetic engineering of crops, to keep the trend of rising yields out, but above about two or three degrees, ah, things get okay. really so, dicey. So, so now we're at really three dicey, and okay. and frankly, nobody knows. And right. there's a huge uncertainty. To me, when there's that much risk of real catastrophe, I think it behooves us to be cautious and actually put the brakes on. You know, years ago in the Clinton administration, my colleague John Holdren, who was on his PCAST, said, you know, this is like you're driving a super tanker and you see a, a shoal up ahead, a reef. And before you run aground, you know that it takes you 10 miles to stop the ship. Do you keep going full speed or do you begin to start reversing course because the risk of running aground is so great? I think that's the way we have to think about this. So I would say, again, you use the word us and you. Uh, there are many diversity of points of view here depending upon where you sit. And if we were having this conversation with some people in Africa or in Southeast Asia, uh, we'd probably have a very different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm teaching a course right now with about 240 students, and about a third of them are from those countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I have conversations with them regularly. What, what I'm hearing is not, you should let us build fossil fuel plants. They will build some fossil fuel plants. What they want is for us to do more. They want us to make good on our $100 billion investment and frankly, do a lot more than that. And they also are pissed off. In Pakistan, the flooding in the Indus River in southern Pakistan, 35 million people are displaced. And frankly, the attribution of, to climate change is complicated. To me, that's not the point. The point is it emphasizes the vulnerability to extreme events and the op-eds written right now in Islamabad are saying, they did this to us. Yeah. We contributed 1% to this. They, Europe and the US did this to us, and they want us to pay up. So the idea that, oh, we, we polluted the air, we warmed the planet, and now you guys can keep doing the same. We're not going to invest in the solution. That's a heartless, uh, that's a heartless attitude, I think. So I, I teach a climate course these days at NYU, and I try to teach the students to think critically. Very important skill, as was mentioned already at the beginning. Uh, I use the Pakistani floods as an example. The Pakistani environmental minister said very soon after the floods, this is the worst since 1961. 
So immediately a flag should go off in your mind and say, well, if it happened in 1961, human influences were much smaller. What does the record of monsoon rainfall look like? And you can easily find that on the web from the Indian Meteorological Bureau. And 1961 was indeed a very wet year, comparable to what we saw uh, last year. But there are other years going back, 150 years, where you see the same thing. The tragedy that we had this year has got to do with the fact that there are a lot of people living in floodplains and the hydrology was really mismanaged, building hard surfaces and so on. So it's, obvious, it's not obviously got anything to do with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's lousy development. So Steve, that's an overstatement because there are lots of good studies that do thousands of calculations and estimates that, that say that the probability with a warmer ocean and a warmer world of these floods happening is something like, they calculate some studies as high as 100 times more likely. Most of them say 10 to 30 times yeah, more likely. Yeah, but we don't see that in the data. You should see 10 times more in the last decade, and you don't. It's, it's, it's more Attribution than studies, that. I like to say, are like the fortune teller telling you that you're going to win after you actually won the lottery. I don't, you I don't, cannot verify those attribution studies at all. I, I don't think that's true. I think you're giving them too little credence. No, well, it's we, not a simple a good piece of science, but I think, it's, I think you're, you're dismissing them altogether. All and that's, science that's is dangerous. You know, any science theory needs to be validated, and there is no way to validate those theories. This is a good segue into what will be our final audience right. question before your closing remarks. Um, and you both are sort of expressing a lot of confidence in your interpretation of the climate change models in terms of how your policy prescriptions. The audience member asks, you know, are climate models good enough to trust uh, climate change projections when they are unable to simulate many features of past and current climates? And I just add that in the past, there are some high profile examples of some maybe hyperbolic statements of people associated with the climate change movement that hadn't come to fruition at this point. What are you and thinking of? Thinking of some inconvenient truth sort of vibe of people who have made claims about certain cities being underwater by certain points in time, and those aren't necessarily coming to fruition. H how do you sort of square I, I, those I, questions? I mean, I, I'm very well aware with every mistake that Vice President Al Gore made in an inconvenient <laughs> truth, mm -hmm. but I don't believe any of what you said is actually one of them. So I think that's a misrepresentation of, of that. There are certainly mistakes he made. He's a politician, not a scientist, but, um, but those aren't among them. He didn't say that, you know, New York or Florida was going to be underwater by 2020 or anything like that. Um, uh, here's what I would say. Climate models, the Earth's a really complicated place. Climate models um, have been evolving, um, but they're really good at forecasting on certain timescales. There's a lot of things they leave out. And there's a lot of things we still don't understand. But I'll tell you something that troubles me. Most of the things that are most prominent that they get wrong are things that are likely to make the problem worse, not better. That is, I would say that the errors in the climate model are most likely to underestimate the problem, not overestimate it. And a nice example is their inability to reproduce warm climates in the past when CO2 was higher. There's a time in Eocene between 55 and about 34 million years ago, which, where the Earth was much, much warmer, no ice at all. And there were palm trees in the middle of Wyoming. Palm trees can't grow where there's really cold winters. The climate models still make winters cold in Wyoming. Now that sounds technical and myopic, but it's actually really important because it says that there's something missing, an amplifier in the real world that isn't in the models. And the, model, the model's not responding as intensely as the real world is. So when I look at the data, I say the real response to higher CO2 in the atmosphere looks greater than what the models are saying. So I would be very cautious. Models are not perfect, but I would be very cautious assuming that the way they're not perfect means the problem won't be as bad. That's a common fallacy that a lot of climate skeptics take advantage of, and I think it's a dangerous one. What we don't know about these models the real world may be much worse, and in fact, is likely to be actually worse based on the data that I know. The modelers themselves say don't believe things at the regional or local level. They give us a hazy picture 
of what might be going on globally. You have to understand how difficult this problem is. The human influences that we're talking about are less than 1% of the natural flows of what goes on in the system. That means you better get the 99% about right if you're going to see the effect of 1% in growing greenhouse gases or aerosols. In addition, we have lousy data on the climate system. Yes, it's pretty good for the last 40 years with satellites and improved ground stations, but climate plays out over decades. Who knows what the temperatures of the ocean were at depth 50 years ago? We do not have very good information on that at all. And oh, by the way, the system is chaotic. And oh, by the way, the models cannot get down to the resolution you need in order to have a lot of confidence with them. So hazy picture at best. Most of the results should be taken with a grain of salt. OK, you will each have five minutes to deliver your closing arguments. Dr. Kunin, your turn to go first. Oh, let me get the, turn this off. Sorry, the sheets that I was going to use. I'm sorry. Oh, and please don't forget to vote in the post-debate poll at the bottom of your card, and we will read the results after the closing arguments are done. OK, could I get up my uh, closing slides if we've got those? Yeah, let's go down a little bit. OK, so um, great. OK. Anthony Downs, an economist who worked at the Brookings Institution, less than eight miles from here, wrote in 1972 about the arc of public attention given to any issue. After bubbling along among experts, an issue bursts into alarm, with alarm into public consciousness accompanied by euphoric enthusiasm for solving the problem. But after a while, people realize just how hard it's going to be, and then there's a gradual decline in interest. I'd submit that climate action, as embodied in this proposition, has been well into phase three and is starting to enter phase four. Here are some of the indicators. The ongoing energy crisis has shown everyone the primacy of energy reliability and affordability over greenhouse gas reductions. Coal consumption has soared and the world is clamoring for gas. Even the Europeans have decided it's okay to say the two F words, fission and fracking. Physical and economic realities eventually prevail. Recent polls show that other issues, including the economy, threats to democracy, Russian and Chinese aggression, immigration, abortion, and gun policy, are far more important to the US electorate than climate change. And think about what will happen as climate action starts to impact ordinary folks through energy costs, reliability, and restrictions on vehicle choice. As I mentioned, the bloom is coming off ESG investing that disfavors fossil fuel companies. Among the reasons are no agreed upon metrics to measure ESG, lower returns by a couple of percent, and little demonstrable impact. The world spent $3.8 trillion on renewables in the decade that ended in 2021. But the fraction of total energy derived from fossil fuels only dropped from 82 to 81 percent. Banks and funds are seriously rethinking and even withdrawing from mitigation pleasures, pledges. Ill-considered efforts to radically transform vital systems have been damaging failures. The Sri Lankan president banned chemical fertilizers in April 2021, motivated by environmental considerations. It took less than a year for that action to crash the Sri Lankan economy, ultimately leading to starvation, riots, and a change in government. That crisis has been described in Foreign Policy magazine as a farrago of magical thinking, technocratic hubris, ideological delusion, self-dealing, and sheer short-sightedness. Similar circumstances are already playing out in Germany, in the UK, in California, and in Texas, where hasty and ill-conceived greening of the energy system has degraded reliability and increased costs in an ineffective effort to avoid vague and uncertain climate problems a few generations from now. 
It would indeed be a climate crisis of a different sort if that were to happen across the US. And Dan, my experts tell me that Massachusetts may well be in for a very tough winter because it's eschewed natural gas and heating oil. We should be very careful in tinkering with energy systems. Precipitous emissions reductions are far more risky than climate change itself. I've shown you tonight that there are multiple reasons to reject the proposition. It's unjustified. The official science and common sense belie that catastrophe is imminent. We clearly have time to think through any large-scale changes in our energy systems, and rapidly reducing emissions won't reduce influences on the climate anytime soon. The proposition is immoral. If you support the proposition, you should check your privilege unless you plan to alleviate energy poverty somehow without fossil fuels. And it is immoral to rob young people of their optimism by exaggerating the climate threat. Finally, the proposition is a techno-economic fantasy. It would take the energy system rapidly in an unnatural direction, degrading the quality of energy services, increasing costs, and leading to more disruption and destitution than any climate change itself. Last week, President Xi told his party, Congress, that China would pursue its emissions goals with prudence in line with getting the new before discarding the old. That scares me because it's much more sensible than the planet on fire rhetoric that we hear from Western leaders and media. Thank you. I don't have any prepared remarks. I want to sum up with just giving you a little perspective on some points of tension here in this discussion. We're doing an experiment on the planet. Again, we haven't done this for millions of years. And there is a lot of uncertainty, and Steve has appropriately pointed to some of the things that climate scientists don't know, or frankly may never know until it comes to pass. Because the Earth system is complex and hard. But I think the scale of what we're doing to the planet needs to be understood. 20,000 years ago, where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, was under about a kilometer of ice. Sea level was about 130 meters lower than today. Very different world with the last glacial maximum. Global temperature was about five degrees colder. We're talking about, in a very short time, 50 times faster than the transition from that world to the one we live in. We're talking about going three to five degrees warmer. Steve can tell you, oh, there's no risk of catastrophe. I think there's a significant risk. What we know tells us that there is a significant risk of catastrophe. And what we haven't talked enough about is, frankly, you, the students here, not just you, but your children and their children, and literally thousands of generations into the future who may curse us today for not doing enough. The idea that it's immoral that we, he said, Steve just said to you, it's immoral unless you're going to give non-fossil renewable energy to poor countries in the world. That's exactly what we need to do. That doesn't mean building it for them, but it means making smart investments to bring those costs down. Let's get cheap EVs. The costs are coming down fast. We're really close to parity. Let's make it happen so poor countries don't have to sacrifice to buy EVs. They do it because it's smart. And there are many other technologies like that. Now, are there really difficult problems, like how to manage really high penetration of wind and solar? Yeah, they're really hard. Frankly, academics are studying them. They're tough problems. But the US is at 14% penetration. And in my career, we're likely to maybe get to 40% where Ireland is today. I think I'm not so worried about solving that problem. That's going to be for you in the back to solve. But I hope that we pass off a world to you that has new technology and, and frankly, new investments, because we have to solve this problem. The alternative is essentially creating something with inertia and time scales that are so long that are going to take the world into a place I think we really don't want to be. 
Nobody can predict exactly how climate change will impact society, but our best information says that it's going too far beyond where we've been is a very dangerous place. And we're doing it very, very quickly. So I would submit that we do have a right. That doesn't mean we destroy our economy in the process, that we do it so rapidly that, that we lose jobs. But there's a smart path forward where we develop new technology, create economic opportunity, and ultimately help the whole world solve this problem. And that's the kind of American leadership we should aspire to. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you all for participating in the poll. Before the debate began, 111 of you responded. 62% of you agreed with Dr. Schrag, uh, large and rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. 14% disagreed, aligning themselves with Dr. Kunin. 24% of you guys were undecided. And now I think we have the results of the final poll. Maybe not. All right, so we did see a, a little bit of movement there, a lot less undecided audience members. So thank you guys, thank you everybody for being here today for this debate. Thank you for Dr. Schrag, Dr. Kunin for participating. Just finally, on behalf of the Steamboat Institute, I'd like to say thank you again to our speakers. They did a fantastic job. They were well prepared, and it takes courage to get on a debate stage. So we respect both of you, and thank you very much. Thank you to the Smith School and the Ed Snyder Center. If you enjoyed tonight's debate and you would like to see more of these, of course, Steamboat Institute and the Snyder Center always welcomes your support. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you.